are Marilee and Joe Hannon from Rose Common Berry Farm. We are located in rural Dallas County, um, outside of Linden, Iowa. We grow strawberries and raspberries currently and are looking at expanding into other berries for future years. We grow our strawberries in a somewhat unique um, situation. They're day neutral strawberries, so we treat them as an annual and plant new ones every spring for harvest uh, somewhere between first harvest starts about July 1st to July 20th, depending on the year a little bit. But what really makes our strawberry system unique is that we grow them in vertical, upright, hydroponic towers. So there is no bending over and picking off the ground. Everything is done from knee high to head high. This is our second year of production on the farm. Last year was just kind of getting things up and going and getting a lot of infrastructure built. Um, we had some definitely major challenges last year, which the Sierra Grant is actually helping us figure out this year. We have about um, nine acres across the whole farm that we own. And right now we just have crops in basically about three quarters to one acre. The strawberries that we have, we had about 17,000 out there when we started this spring. Again, but that's all in, you know, a half acre size. We had three weeks of rain literally every single day. So you'll find a few um, empty potholes and things out there. Um, but that's a really good comparison of what works well under flooding and drought conditions because we've had flood condition, well, not flood last year, but we had a lot of rain last year during the growing season. We had kind of some preliminary trials set up. We've had basically now at this point, three weeks up until today when we record it of bone dry weather. Um, and so I think we're going, we're going to learn a lot of good information from the yeah. trial this year. And we already have. We've started we collecting have. some of our data and can easily see a difference between certain of our trials of our different media as far as different take rates. So we're seeing some plant size, results. plant health, mm -hmm. labor that's involved. Mm -hmm. How can we mechanize some of this? And we'll talk about all of that as we go through the individual. Yeah. We have 15 rows of our towers out here. Um, we have 10 rows that are 60 towers each, roughly, give or take, and then 5 that are 40 um, in our smaller field. And in each of the towers, so each of the 60 or 40, there are 5 of these cloverleaf pots that just stack, snap together. And so each pot holds four plants. So then for each tower, it's 20, obviously multiplied out for the field itself. Um, in our trial, we have four different media types that are in the middle of our field, our big field. So we can see side-by-side -side comparisons of what they look like um, compared to each other. The field that you see behind us, it's basically we had to put together a trellis to hold the pots up. They're all, um, it's half inch conduit with an uh, inch and a half, inch and a quarter or something like that. PVC that holds the tower or the pots up off the ground at knee height there. Um, because we're on a windy location, we had to go through and add some end posts and some ground stakes and a couple eight foot T posts staggered throughout with a high tensile wire. There's not really any tension on that wire, but just something to hold those conduit from moving around. You'll notice that our rows are north and south here. It, the property actually doesn't quite look like it is north and south the way we're sitting here, but it actually is sitting fairly close to north-south. And the reason that they're set there or set up like that way is so that the morning sun can come up in trans and move over and actually catch um, basically three sides of the towers over the course of the day in order to get uniform growth and uniform ripening. Mm -hmm. um, it is a management tact thing that we have to do though is go through and rotate those pots uh, 180 degrees once a day. We do that for sunlight. We do that to give the plants a little bit of a break from the wind and irrigation and irrigation, water flow distribution through the towers. This is our first trial. Um, this is a mix of the chips that we saw hydrating before that was in the bag. Not ground up though, it's just the chips. 
and then it's a mix of the peat material that we saw hydrated and it's mixed at uh, one part peat three parts chips mm -hmm. i believe um so the peat holds the water the cheap chips give us drainage um the chips actually ebb and flow a little bit of nutrients i think as well i can't 100 verify that so pros to this media is it's fairly well drained um, and you can easily change drainage by adding more peat to that mix to suit your needs um, right now we're finding about similar water usage across the board from all our media out here um, i don't know that that will hold through as plants start to size up though next treatment here is the peat that we had so the ground up peat mixed up with the chips that we have but the chips are also ran through the chipper shredder thing um i think we're at one part peat and three parts of uh, ground up chips out here the chips themselves are pretty well drained and get pretty dry and there that one is a great option for wet years so we wanted to see if we could find that same material and make it to be a little bit more suitable for a wet year you, you end up with a ton of labor i mean because you're already running stuff for the chipper then you got to back mix it with the peat and it doesn't store well so it's not something we can do during the off season yeah, i've got iron chlorosis on some of these some of these leaves so i still need to foliar feed it and things like that and account for some of the excessive leaching that the other media has so i'm not gaining anything by adding the extra labor to this media so this one will never be seen on this farm again <laughs> another media that's in the trial this one is the chips that we had and then ran through the chipper shredder mulcher thing and it's just a nice fine grain material that we saw earlier the reason that we like this one is it's very well drained so we get into a wet year water moves down through here and these strawberries are never wet in fact we got a half inch of rain this morning we may if it gets sunny and warm out we may have to irrigate this afternoon um, and I should mention all of these are on a twice a day irrigation cycle. That's the way we're set up. The challenges on it though is the nutrients run out and then you end up with iron deficiency. So you can see I've got some iron deficiency here. So it becomes really critical to make sure that you're managing putting just enough water on to get everything hydrated, but not too much and leaching excess out. And then coming back in, you're going to have to do some foliar feeding after a rainfall. Labor wise, um, the stuff is really easy to hydrate. It's yeah. really easy to chip, other than it takes time. Right, time is the worst part of the labor with this. It um, planting into it is really easy. Um, it really doesn't take much time at all. It's so fine that you can just pop the plant right in. Yeah. Um, really, it's the time that it takes to hydrate and run everything through the the wood chipper finally we have our peat and perlite mix this is again more closer to what's generally used for hydroponic strawberries and flat culture beds um, this is nice because you can pre-mix it and put it all together and run it through an auger or a pot filler i mean this is designed to go through a pot filler it's also the cheapest overall of all the different types of media and the lowest labor of all the different types of media going to a what i think is a little bit higher quality peat media going to a higher ratio of perlite in there and perlite is going to um, detract water so it's going to shed water away from the plants it's actually working out pretty well for us the challenge on it is it dries out and so when it dries out it blows mm -hmm. and so we have peat and perlite that's Everywhere. flown all over the place <laughs> out of here it's hard to keep it wet it's on a windy windy day inside a greenhouse or a high tunnel where we could provide wind protection this would be great because it would never blow around it'd be pretty easy to manage and keep in place water flow and distribution across these at the pots throughout the tower by far this is the best mm -hmm. um, again it's going to be your better option when you get into a droughty situation like we've had the last couple weeks we get into a wet period we may end up struggling again so we'll we'll have to see how that goes the other thing that i like about this is that you can direct seed and plant other things into it pretty easily 
Uh, one other thing to note with the peat and perlite is I had commented on the ease in planting into the chipped up stuff. This is even easier. I think I had timed at one point and we were able to plant an entire tower in a minute. Which means on a long row you got an hour planting, which is fast. I mean, you can do a short row like this, one person in 45 minutes. Right. Um, and our reports will all reflect actual person hours per mm -hmm. per unit, um, but it's fast. So what led us to the Sarah Farmer Rancher program? Um, one of the challenges with growing strawberries in these vertical upright towers is um, water distribution, water holding capacity in these towers. Oftentimes you will see the bottom pots of these towers get too much water and uh, they go um, they start showing signs of iron chlorosis boron deficiency and it's very difficult to manage water distribution and nutrient distribution through those vertical towers um, looking at the SARE projects looking at a lot of the other research nobody's really doing a lot of research on these vertical towers are all flat dead based systems whether it's farmer ranchers or whether it's university research we had a very specific question that we wanted to answer very specific to our farm but it's applicable to people that are growing vertical strawberries across across the country um and then knowing krista um poking around and asking some questions about how we go about go about doing this whether we can make it work for us that's kind of what drove us to actually taking a chance to write um a project for the sayer farmer rancher grant here in the north central region how easy or how difficult that is i'm a little bit biased because i write grants on a fairly regular basis um but again we knew what problem that we wanted to address and we were able to sit down and go through that process for the sayer farmer rancher grant um I think we started writing it and we set it aside for about six months mm -hmm. at one point because we knew we were going to apply, but it wasn't around. But I spent a few hours one night kind of throwing ideas together and starting to figure out what our plots were going to look like. And then when we came back to actually write it and finish putting it together, it was not difficult. One of the more challenging parts of the proposal, although I found it to be really valuable, was to go back and look at what the other Sarah folks had been do doing in other mm -hmm. regions. We found a lot of good information that was being done in other places and we were able to talk about what else is being done and how or why it's not relevant to us. But we did find some tips and tricks and some information that we pulled from those and we'll actually be able to show some of the stuff that we pulled. Uh, not part of this part particular project, but stuff that we pulled from another project that we're, that we're trying out on our own farm.